This morning as I was uh, getting ready for the message, um, I was using this wonderful laptop. I'm going to talk about it again, but uh, I say that's like the best present I've ever had. I mean, I it really, truly, from my heart, um, evidently this thing, as I've gotten out of the box and started looking at it, is built for an ogre. It's made for giant hands, okay, so it's perfect. And... Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank you again for everybody that sacrificed to uh, buy this as a gift. And it's just an amazing gift. And uh, this morning as I was preparing my message, um, I couldn't get it to sync with my printer. So I've still got a little work to do. And, and, and this morning, um, the enemy just, um, I haven't really felt that walking into the church before. But the enemy, this morning, I'm just discerning a spirit of opposition and when I walked into the building I felt it when I was printing my notes I felt it and um, how many have ever felt uh, just a spirit of opposition where the enemy just kind of stands there and he feels like he can intimidate you uh, he feels like your faith uh, did you feel this morning like your faith was nothing or it was dead or it was gone or you felt the taunt of the enemy and I felt that when I was trying to get this printer to work for two hours this morning. And I thought, wow, you know, it's not syncing up. I thought I had that thing working. And, and uh, some of you need, this isn't part of my message, but some of you, we're going to pray against it this morning. But some of you need to be like David when the mighty giant stood in the valley. And uh, David said, who is this? Think about it. Who is this that's standing in front of me right now? Who are you? to defame the name of God. And some of you need to just look at the giant and just laugh. You know, because the enemy can rage all he wants. The enemy can't take away what you got. The enemy can't take away what we have as a church. And the enemy walks in this place and thinks that, I mean, you know, the enemy just tries to wipe out this whole service this morning. It's the most, uh, uh, the biggest attack of an enemy on a Sunday morning I've ever seen. And I just laughed this morning. I said, enemy, I don't need those notes. I don't have to have those notes. I picked up the laptop and took it with me and said, I don't even need to print it. And if the enemy took my notes, I don't care. You know, the enemy is not going to stop what God wants to do in this world. The enemy's not going to stop you. The enemy's not going to stop me. And God's just looking for a few people like David that are willing to stand up to the enemy and just laugh. Because the enemy can't take what you have. All right, so we're going to pray this morning, and we're going to pray against the enemy. Heavenly Father, right now, Lord God, I come against the enemy, Lord. Father, I just pray your anointing in this place, Lord God. Father, you have a purpose. You have a plan, Lord God. These are your sons and your daughters, Lord God. Oh, Father, what you've ordained for this church, Lord God, the enemy can't stop, Lord God. Right now, I just pray that your spirit would begin to move on this word, Lord. Begin to change hearts, Lord God. We don't want to be the same, Lord. Change us. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to try to go from this laptop this morning because I don't have any notes. So let's hope it works. Uh-oh. All right. Praise the Lord. Um, <coughs> turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Title of my message is Pillars of the Church. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of the bread and in prayers. That's from the New King James Version. NIV says they devoted themselves to what did they devote themselves to? The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Last week I preached a message. Last week I preached a message about God calling the church. God started calling his first disciples, and I was trying to make you understand last week who you are in Christ. And, and, and when Jesus went to build his church, he looked for his first four disciples, and it would be Andrew, Peter, James, and John, two sets of brothers. But here's the kicker, they're fishermen. 
Okay, he didn't go to the synagogue. He went to the fisherman and called his first disciples to build the church. Folks, that's his apostles and his pastors. Okay, he called fishermen. And these fishermen, you could see a devotion. They were third shift workers. Uh, they were the first ones to recognize he was the Messiah. They were at his baptism. They were there when John was preaching. Uh, they were seeking out Jesus Christ, and nobody in the church was looking for him. But the fishermen seen him. And they were a rugged group. And, 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 you know, there's a reason I believe, I've thought about, why did God call the fishermen? Why did he call them to launch his church? And why did he call them to change the world? And the reason why is there's something in those fishermen that's different than the people that were in the church at the time. There was something in the fishermen that was not in the theologians in the universities at that time or he would have chose them. And I think what it is is they were fishermen. They were a uh, rugged group. They were not afraid to launch out into seriously bad weather. They weren't afraid to launch out when circumstances weren't right. They were afraid if somebody tried to stop their progress. They weren't afraid of a little failure. These fishermen were different kind of people. And God chose them to be the apostles. Just Are you really even thinking about that, or are you just listening to a message? He went to the Sea of Galilee and found fishermen and built his church upon them and began to instruct them. And this is the second part of that message because a lot of us, when we think of the Bible, we think, oh, wow, uh, he called his disciples. He taught them during the last few years of his life died, was resurrected, and he launched them. And somehow we forget all the stuff that's in the middle, and we just say, oh, they were out doing miracles and great things. So what we do is we say to ourselves, well, that's what God's going to do with me. He's just going to call me, and I'm going to be out there doing great signs and wonders, and I'm going to immediately leap to where Peter and Paul and James and John, somehow we miss the whole between of it. And the whole in-between is what God is calling this church to be. <clears throat> the whole in-between is how do we launch people in this church into ministry? And you say, well, is everybody going to be a senior pastor? No, but everybody is going to be a minister. Everybody is going to reach the world uh, with the gospel. Because who is going to reach your family? Who's going to reach your friends? You say, well, Pastor, that's why we hired you. Right? I mean, now, now, is that what some people think? That's why we have leaders. That's why we have a head of a church. And God just, the Spirit of God was just working me on me this week to challenge, um, challenge you on those issues. Challenge you on the issue of fellowship, number one. And God is calling People with the heart of those fishermen still today. He's calling people that aren't afraid to launch out. People that aren't afraid to be what he called this early church to be. And it says there were four things that they devoted themselves to. And this is what I'm calling the pillars of the church. They're pillars that stand really strong. And if you want to be a great church, the church that God called us to be, we have to stand on those four pillars. And the four pillars are, now really think about this. Don't just listen to the verse and say, well, you know, he's going to read a verse and you, know, and you just move on. Think about these four things. They seem a little unusual to me, a few of them. You tell me in your mind, don't, don't say it out loud, in your mind which ones sound unusual. They devoted themselves to four things. The, teach, the apostles' teaching, <coughs> fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. So keep that in your mind. Those are the four things that they devoted themselves to. Meaning they were, this isn't just they did things and they were activities of the church. It says that they, uh, in fact, the other version says it's they continued steadfastly or they devoted themselves to this. And so whatever they were doing here, it worked because they turned the entire world upside down. They completely changed the world. So somehow we have to capture what is it they were doing. 
And one thing, uh, when I used to run my business and was really growing in my business and, and really, you know, looking for ways to be the best at, that I could be at what I was doing, I uh, went to some different, um, I'd really uh, considered franchising my company into different areas. And so I was in a meeting of uh, uh, just training people franchise organizations. And one thing that I found really interesting is they asked the question to start the training, what is it, what is it that draws people to a big franchise like McDonald's? And he said, I bet you won't have the answer to this question. And so he took different hands, and they'd raise their hand, and they'd say, Big Mac. You know, somebody said, well, you know, French fries. You know, all these different things that people begin to mention as the reasons why they're successful and why people go to a franchise. And you know what the answer ended up being? Consistency. That's exactly it. You can go to a McDonald's in Beijing, China. You can go to a McDonald's in Russia. You can go to a McDonald's in America. You can go to a McDonald's in any state. And when you open that box, guess what you find? The exact same thing that you found everywhere. And that's the reason why people like that. And Jesus was establishing his church. And what Jesus is saying is this church is meant to be established everywhere. And what you should find in this church is the consistency of what I'm calling my church to be. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And what he was saying was what I'm doing with this church that I'm planting right here, I'm going to be the leader of that church. He's saying, it's my church, and I will build it. I'm sorry, my voice is breaking. I think I'm going through puberty, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's happening all at once, so I'm trying to cope with it, okay? So help me out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what he was saying was, if you understand this pattern, and if the churches understand who runs the church, you will do the things that they did in this early church. I really believe this message is the groundwork for what God wants us to do this year. I think God wants to launch us, but in order to launch us, you don't go from point A to point B, which is, uh, you know, far away lands preaching the gospel and, and casting out demons. There's a whole in-between here that we have to get a hold of. We have to build the church on the same pillars that they built their church on. And if we can do that and we can be successful and we can do it together, there's nothing God can't do in this church. It, it, it'll be an awesome thing if we get a hold of it. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Number one, the apostles' doctrine or teaching. Now, this is an area you would immediately look at this area, and I know this isn't the most exciting sermons. I like the ones where I get to rant and rave and yell and do all this stuff, but this is an important message. This is as important as anything ever, but the apostles' doctrine is the first thing that they were devoted to. Do you understand they were devoted? They weren't just teaching. It's everybody was united in their devotion of the apostles' teaching. And here's one of the, the one thing I want you to gather at the very beginning. In fact, Acts chapter 1, let me read it. You don't have to turn there, but Acts chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in my former, this is Luke. Uh, Luke is writing his purpose for, Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And he's telling them the purpose of why he wrote this book and this history of the church. And he wrote it to a person called Theophilus. Uh, he's trying to put everything in accurate order of here's what happened, here's how it happened, and here's why I'm writing it to you. In the former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all the things, now listen, all the things Jesus began to do and teach until the time he was taken up to heaven. He began to do and teach until he went to heaven. Now what's unusual about that? He began to do and teach until he went to heaven. Something unusual about that? 
play over in your mind. Don't let me tell you. He began to do and teach until he went to heaven. He began. <laughs> that was the beginning of his teaching from the time that he ta taught till the time he was resurrected. That was the beginning of his teaching. And, and, and every theologian will tell you as you study the book of Acts, it's the one book that just abruptly ends and there's no completion to it. There's no finish to it. Because Jesus began to teach. The time he was resurrected, he was just beginning to teach. See, this thing we call church, you know, I was voted in as the senior pastor, and it's really easy to say, oh, man, I don't know about him. He's the captain of our ship, man. I hope it sinks. And I, and I, and I say that to be funny, but, you know, there's, there's attitudes like that. And, and I'm not upset with you. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't upset me. You know, it doesn't make me feel like, oh, man, they don't like me. I don't like them. I don't feel that way because these are human emotions. Because sometimes we look and we say, man, he's the leader of this church, and I'm not. I'm just simply not the leader of this church. You're not going to be judged by how you accept me as a leader because I'm not the leader. I'm the senior pastor, but Jesus is the leader of this church. He began to do, he began to teach, he began to do these things, and it says, listen to this, when they chose a successor to Jesus, or to Judas, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 1, verse 24, it says, the Lord chose Judas. How is that? How did he choose Judas when he wasn't even there? But see, Jesus is still leading this church. He's the one doing all the work. He's leading through his Holy Spirit. It goes on the day of Pentecost. Explain in chapter 2, verse 33. He says, as they begin to speak in tongues on the day of Pentecost, Peter makes it clear that it was the risen Jesus who did this. Isn't that odd? Because they didn't say these things in the Old Testament. But he says, Jesus, the tongues that you see on this day of Pentecost, Jesus is the one that did that. They're saying that he is personally doing this. They go on. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. The early church is growing in number. Do you know what it says? The Lord was adding to their number day by day of those who were being saved. You see that he said he's building his church, and everything he does in the church is a direct order and a direct act from Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Do you understand that, that, that the early church, everything that they did, Jesus began his ministry, began his teaching, and then the Bible says that he continued to do it through the Holy Spirit in person. It goes on. Peter and John healed the man by the temple gate. They make it clear, we did not heal this man. It was Jesus Christ who healed him. Now, why would they say that? Jesus Christ is pulling all the strings. Jesus Christ is doing all the work. All they had to do was submit to the Holy Spirit, and it was Jesus Christ in person doing the things that Jesus Christ wants to do. And Jesus Christ is the leader of this organization. He's the leader of the church, and all God's asking to do is he's saying, why are you against me? Why are you opposing me? Why are you not moving with me? Why are you not allowing me? My voice isn't going to make it this morning. Pray for me. <clears throat> Jesus is saying, why are you not with me? This is me leading this thing. That Holy Spirit, it's Jesus Christ in person. It's the Spirit of God working through you, and it's Jesus continuing to do His ministry. And Jesus Christ has built these pillars, and He said, the church of Jesus Christ, if you'll get a hold of this, and you'll realize you're resisting Jesus Christ when you avoid building His church, then we'll get somewhere. You don't resist me. I don't resist Him. We resist Jesus Christ because He's trying to do his ministry in this world, and he does it through the church. Always. Always through the church. As I go on, Saul of Tarsus was converted. 
God saves him. Jesus Christ personally sent Paul to go to Ananias to receive his vision back. I could go on and on in the book of Acts, but every single moment there's a decision made. They say Jesus Christ made it. Jesus Christ said this to this person. Jesus Christ did this to this person. Jesus Christ is every string is being pulled by Jesus Christ. And what God is telling us is the apostles' doctrine, why is it different? The reason it's different is because when he gave us the Holy Spirit, he took charge of his church. And if we walk in the Spirit church, we're walking in the very presence of God. It's like Jesus is pastoring this church. It's like Jesus is loving people in this church. It's like Jesus is caring for people in this church. It's all in the Spirit of God. Because when we get hold of the Spirit of God, God is given the ability to do things in the world. In fact, do you know that God has ordained everything good in this world through the Holy Spirit? Well, no, that don't make sense, because if that's true, I would have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit to do anything for God. Why do you think the Bible says that those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God? Why do you say, don't fulfill the works of the flesh, walk in the Spirit? Because Jesus Christ is wanting to operate in this world, and he only does it through the Holy Spirit. So church, we better get a hold of the Holy Spirit. We better figure out who the Holy Spirit is. Praise God. So the next thing that they were devoted to, and this is a big one here, they were devoted to fellowship. Devoted. Now, why would you have to be devoted to fellowship? You know, this is the word that was on my mind all week. The Holy Spirit just kept saying fellowship, fellowship. What's broken fellowship? broken fellowship when it's broken maybe we know better what it is than when it's good because I think sometimes when we think of fellowship you know what we think about let's get together and have donuts and coffee let's have some fellowship man let's go to the fellowship hall because that's where real fellowship is and that's part of it that's a very shallow part of it it's a good it's a really good part of it because we get to eat and we get food, and that's a big part of fellowship. It's a big thing, and it's a big thing in the Bible, breaking bread together and having enjoying time together. And But sometimes when we think of fellowship, we don't do it justice because that's not the biblical fullness of it. Fellowship is an interesting, interesting word. Let me just take the shallow definition of it, the one that I've always held on to that's a really nice one, I think. We're fellows. On the same ship. Fellows on the same ship. I thought you were the captain. I'm not the captain. I'm just a fellow on the same ship. I'm just trying to survive myself. I'm trying to deal with the ups and downs of life. I'm trying to do the best I can to, to be a pastor in this church. And the best I can, you know, it burns in my heart to fulfill God's call in my life and see this church fulfill the call of God. But I'm just a fellow on the ship with you. But here's the easy thing. Easy thing to say is, I don't like, I don't like him. I don't know if I want to be on his ship. I don't like the church. I don't know if I want to be in the church. But here's the thing, in the Bible, there's not that option. The Bible is you either love one another and you want to be a part of the fellowship or you don't love one another and you don't want to be a part of the fellowship. And the Bible is, uh, the Bible is very clear that the fellowship thing is much bigger than we think it is. And so as you go a little deeper, and I'm going to get into the Greek word here in a second, but as you go a little deeper, you say, well, wait a minute. I know what fellowship is. It's where I've had a really good contact with people in the church, and we've really, you know, we've really had a kindred spirit, and I could tell them what I'm going through, 
I could pray with them. They encourage me. They love me. And yeah, that's a part of it. We're getting a little deeper in the fellowship now, but this is a pillar. This is one of the four pillars that the church stands on. And so we got to get it right together. We got to get this right. Because if we have broken fellowship, what happens to the building? It's a very susceptible to falling. Uh, our lives are very susceptible to falling. You say, man, how many have ever had a time of broken fellowship? It's like, man, I, I haven't been around believers. I haven't been getting that fellowship. And you know the feeling when it feels broken. So how can we make, this is our goal. This is, we we want to devote ourselves. James, you, you covered a lot of that when you were talking. I was like, wow, man, I just give him the mic. He can preach my sermon. But, you know, devoting ourselves to fellowship. Let's look at this word. Let me give you the English definition. English definition is, and they really try to find, this is an old Webster's Dictionary definition, companionship, company, associate, community, unified body, partnership. That's pretty good. So let's think about this. Partnership. Because as you begin to get in the word, the word is actually koinos. And as you get into the Greek word, you realize this is a definition of a purse. You know, a, a, gar or a bag that's made to hold money. And then they connect that with another word that means share. So what it actually means, literally, there's other places in the New Testament where the word is used for, uh, like James and John were partners in their business. That's what they were. That's that same word, fellowship, koinonia. They were in partnership with one another in a business. So what God is trying to tell us is this fellowship, uh, they all had everything in common with one another. In fact, turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 again. Simplest definitions of that word is common. It means they share everything in common. That's literally what the word means. That's why the purse analogy is what's used because they share. It's like having a purse with a certain amount of money in it and everybody has to share whatever's in there. That's everybody's total is together and everybody shares out of that one thing. It's common and everybody shares it. Now look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of the breaking of the bread, or devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonder, wonders and miraculous signs were done by the, by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common they sold their possessions and goods and they gave to anyone else that had anyone as he had need every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes and ate together with a glad and sincere heart praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved now remember these were all foreigners people from out of town were there for the day of Pentecost and so in order for them to remain in that area, a lot of them didn't have houses, they didn't have money, they didn't have food. So they all lingered for 40 days in Jerusalem and everything was shared common. I mean, all those people that were there and everybody shared things common, they met daily. And what God is trying to tell us is, you know, a lot of times, let me get, let me get this one, let me, let me cover this one first. If anybody here ever been a partner in a business? Okay, this word literally says we're all partners in Jesus Christ, that we're all partakers. That word partakers is actually fellowship. And it says that we're all partakers of Christ. That's what we'll do today. He's trying to tell us that we're partakers of his body and his blood. It says we've received eternal life because of that. And because of this partaking of Jesus' blood and his, 
and his body, he said, we are all partners in the work of Christ. We're all together to reach the lost the way God reached us, and we're all equal partners in Christ. You say, well, wait a minute. I'm not a partner. You're the pastor. But what God's saying is, no, the fellowship of the brethren, the devotion to fellowship is we're all partners in this thing. And what God's going to judge us one day is how well did we partner together to reach the lost? How well did we partner together to reach one another? How much did we partner together to do these things? And some people will come up sometimes, and, and, I, and I will tell you this, I'm the worst fundraiser that ever lived. Because money to me, I don't even care to even discuss money. I just, I just hate money. I mean, I know it's got good uses and all that kind of thing, but it's just not something that, um, I, I don't know, it's just not something that I have a love for, let's put it that way. And I'm the worst fundraiser that ever lived, but people will come up sometimes and say, what, 10%? You know, I don't, I don't that's just not biblical, I'm not doing it. You know, I'm not, that's, and I'm not even going to argue with you. I'm not, I, I disagree with that. It's not something I preach on on a regular basis. It's not something I cut you off from fellowship. I love you just as much whether you pay a tithe or whether you don't. I never look to see what the tithes are. But here's the truth. Sometimes I feel pretty fortunate because they gave everything. <laughs> you say, well, what's the New Testament pattern? The New Testament pattern was they gave a lot more than that <laughs> because they were partners. And what if you had a business partner? Some of us are silent partners. In fact, we're not even a good silent partner sometimes. God is calling us to have a deeper level of fellowship, and it's not about the money. It's how dedicated am I to reaching the world with the gospel? How much fellowship, and let me say it the other way, partnership do I have? How much of a partner am I in the family business? How active am I in the family business? And I'm not saying, please don't get me wrong, money means nothing to me, ties mean nothing to me. What I'm saying is, how dedicated or devoted am I to fellowship? How devoted am, am I to my fellow church people? How devoted am I to making sure that we reach the world with the gospel? How devoted am I to being the kind of church he's talking about here? And it says that they were devoted completely to fellowship. They wanted to share in every part of it. They wanted to share in those who were in need. They wanted to share when there were, when there were different needs in the church. They were completely devoted uh, to fellowship. Uh, one thing that they were devoted to, partnership, let's see, what's a little different for me? The next thing they were devoted to was the breaking of bread. Now, how many thought that was the odd one? Anybody think that was a little odd of the four? Which one? Anybody think anything was odd? That one? Okay, I, I kind of did too. I mean, I, I was studying it, and, and God, I was saying, God, just reveal to me what you want this church to be built upon. You know, I understand the teaching. And, you know, the, the reason why I bring a message like this, let me go back just for a little bit, is we're going to have to be devoted to learning the Word of God. In fact, everything that we're going to be doing to the church is going to be a devotion to raising up people to launch. Okay, I want to train people not only so you can live your life day to day, but I want you out there teaching other people. I want to raise up preachers. I want to raise up teachers. You say, well, why do I need to be teaching? Because your family needs to hear it. You need to be able to teach a Bible study with your family. You need to be able to convince people at work what the Word of God said. Apostles teaching was just simply this. Why do I need to learn it? Because you're going to need to know about grace when you start battling sin. How many have ever battled sin and didn't understand grace? Oh, I battled sin and didn't understand grace. You know what that means? That means I felt like a failure. Man, I failed, God. I'm terrible. I'm miserable. I'm awful. I cannot worship. How many have went through a period of your life where you could not worship because you were too filthy to worship because you didn't understand grace? And what God's saying is we want to, as soon as people walk in these doors, we want to be devoted to teaching. We want to be devoted to teaching every age group in this church. We're going to make this church a place where we can raise up leaders, a place where we can raise up teachers, a place where we can raise up people that know the Word of God really well. And that's what 
sustain. You've got to be devoted to it or you can't accomplish it. The same thing with fellowship. We've got to raise up a church that's better at fellowship, a church that's better at caring for one another's needs, a church that is better at, at, at recognizing when somebody misses church. Again, Pastor, it's your job. According to this scripture here, it's our job together. We've got to devote ourselves to fellowship. We've got to devote ourselves to praying for the sick. We've got to devote ourselves to finding when people are down and depressed and out. We've got to do that. We've got to build that pillar strong. We've got to build the teaching pillar really strong and then breaking of bread. Now, as you begin to study this and you begin to cross-reference in the Bible, one thing that's very clear is communion. You know, one of the pillars was communion and the breaking of bread. But then, as much as I love communion, as much as communion is an incredible experience as a believer, I mean, it is your, um, it is just your um, revelation of who you are in Christ. I mean, it really is. And in every way, it's a, it's a, a wonderful thing. And I kept saying, God, there's got to be deeper. This is a pillar got to be even deeper than that and and as you begin to look there's even some debate is it even the breaking of bread when we fellowship together because in some places it looks like breaking of bread is where they broke the bread and had a love feast together and they all just basically is an agape feast that they would have every week at church and it looks like the breaking of bread also includes the fellowship of everybody together and then I started saying God there's got to be more and as I begin to just really think about it and really pray about it, um, John chapter 6 came to mind. Turn there if you would, John chapter 6. And I know this is not one of my normal messages, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is good stuff. John chapter 6, verse 56, it says, in fact, I'm going to start in 53. This is where Jesus started to lose disciples. This is the one moment where they, many of the disciples, a lot of disciples followed him, and many of them left and never came back because of this. It was so disgusting to them that they were just appalled by him. And here's what he said. Then the, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a very hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling among this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he, has, he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. Now, Jesus starts to say this, and a lot of the disciples, they don't understand it. They don't understand what he's saying, why he's saying it. How many think if you were there, that would be appalling? Saying, eat my blood, or drink my blood, and eat my body. And they just don't understand exactly what he's saying. And um, so Jesus, they still don't understand this, but many of them continue to follow him. 
And then on the road to Emmaus, I believe this is uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 13, if I remember right. It's not in my notes. But it says, now the same day, this is after Jesus was rec- resurrected. Jesus is walking with his disciples. And um, I want you to notice what happens here. This is very unusual. And I believe that the, the early church associated this event with the breaking of bread. It says, now the same day two were walking, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. It was seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now who's walking with them? Jesus had died and was resurrected. He's actually walking with them, but they don't see him. They don't see Jesus at all. They, they recognize him. They, they see a man there with them walking, so Jesus just kind of plays along. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, and their faces were downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in the last few days? What things, Jesus asked. Isn't that awesome? Jesus is talking about his death and resurrection. Everybody in the whole city is talking about it. He's, this is right when he was resurrected and the women went to the tomb, found it empty, and Jesus is walking with these two disciples, and he's saying, what happened? What things? And he goes on, and he says, About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God, and all the people, the chief priests and rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death. They crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us this morning. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels and that he was alive. Some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He's explaining himself in all the scriptures. He's beginning to reveal himself to them, but they still don't know who he is. They still don't realize this is Jesus. They're still looking and he's talking to them and And he's telling them all about himself in the Bible, but they still don't realize it's Jesus. And then he goes on. And he says, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he would go farther. Do you understand what it's saying here? Jesus is walking. He's talking about himself. He's revealing himself. They still don't see him. Jesus is in danger of walking and leaving them. Do you understand what God's telling us today, church? We can go on with this thing without Jesus. We can have church without Jesus. How many know that? We can talk about him. We can hear about him. We can explain in the scriptures who he is. But we're in danger of losing him. We're in danger of him walking ahead of us and and us losing him. And a lot of churches just let him keep walking. But they stop and they say, don't. It says, they, he continued as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly. That means they would not let him leave. They would not let him go ahead of them. They would not let him walk away from them. They urged him strongly in church. This is what the breaking of the bread is. God wants us to urge him strongly. God wants us to be in his presence. God wants to commune with us. God wants to break bread with us. You know, God wants to commune with us. He wants us to want his presence. He wants us to want to hear his voice. He wants to be a part of this church. He wants to pastor your church. He wants to pastor your life. He wants to speak to you every day. God wants to commune with you. And it says they urged him strongly to stay he was and it says uh it was nearly evening the day was almost over he went in to stay with them i hope god will want to stay with us 
when he was at the table with them, what did he do? He took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and as he began to give it to them, their eyes were open and they recognized him. The breaking of bread, do you think it was an accident that at the breaking of the bread, they recognized him? At the breaking of the bread, Jesus' presence was there. They recognized him. If it was an accident, they wouldn't repeat it. They go on, and it says, They recognized him, and he what? Disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we ta- when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? God had put a fire in them. God wanted to now reveal himself to them. God was trying to reveal himself to them. They urged him strongly. He breaks the bread, and then they recognize who he is. And it says they got up, returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those that were with them assembled together. And they said, it's true, the Lord has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. They repeated it. The breaking of the bread has to do with the presence of Jesus Christ. And I started looking even deeper. And there's a cross-reference with the consecration of a priest. And it says when when that priest consecrates himself to the Lord, he's to bake the bread, mix it with the oil of the Holy Spirit. And when that bread is broken, he's to brush it with oil. And what God was telling them is, as often as you come together, break the bread. As often as you come together, I want Jesus to be revealed in your presence. The Bible says that when, 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 when two or three gather together in his name, he is there. Do you understand? God's presence should be in this place every time we break the bread. Every time the bread is broken and we come together, we ought to have an expectation that God is in the house and his spirit is ready and willing to move. He wants to launch you out. He wants If he can take the fishermen and launch them out, why can't he just rub that oil all over you? Why can't the Holy Spirit, when God breaks us apart, why can't God fill us with his Holy Spirit? Why can't God move on our behalf? And then the last thing that they devoted themselves to, and I may have just enough voice to do this, the last thing, God is calling the church to devote themselves to prayer. And I keep talking about a prayer room. And you know, when, when we think of a prayer room, we think of it like we do fellowship halls. That would be really cool for our one day a week prayer meeting. But God's not calling us to a prayer room. God's calling us to be devoted to prayer. God wants to teach us how to pray in every part of our life. You know that God wants to teach us to pray for things that we never thought we could pray for before. God does everything. I want you to think about this, church. God does everything through prayer. You have not because you ask not. And you know what? God is going to mature this church, and we're going to learn how to pray. We're going to be devoted to prayer because it is a pillar of this church. And you say, wow, what does that mean? What does that mean, devoted to prayer? It means that God is going to take you so deep in his presence that you're going to walk in his spirit. God's going to begin to change your maturity level. There's something that happens when a person begins to learn how to pray. You begin to fall in love with it. You say, prayer is laborsome. Not when you learn how to pray. Not when you learn how to get in his presence. Not when you begin to learn to love his presence. I'm going to tell you something. When you get in the presence of God, the weight just goes away. When you learn to get in the presence of God, the weight of this world will literally lift off of you. It's where you exchange your burdens and say, hey, my burden is light. And I found that in God's presence. You know, God speaks to me in my life in his presence. And I'm telling you, this church is called to be like that church. This church needs to learn to get in his presence, and we're going to devote ourselves to prayer. We're going to learn how to love God's presence. 
We're going to learn how to get in God's presence. We're going to learn to hear from God. Praise God. Bow your heads if you would to stand with me this morning. Turn on the lights. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to close. We're going to close with communion. Church, can I tell you something this morning? This is the hardest message I've ever had to preach. I just feel like I'm embattled on every side. I feel like it was hard to even get my notes here this morning. It's hard to get my mind right this morning. And uh, even now, I just know that this message is for this church. And uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I'm going to ask the uh, elders to come up here, David, Eddie. And uh, just know this church, that we... um, We're in this thing together. We're in this thing together. If we can learn that, if we can learn the the fellowship of the saints, if we can learn the fellowship of the Spirit, if we can learn what God's called us to do as a church, God is going to launch this church out. And, 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 And this communion, as we take it this morning, I just want to pray that God would begin to reveal himself just like he did in the Word of God this morning. That was a revelation God gave me this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm going to...